Welcome to the premier video podcast of Art of the Cut. I'm Steve Hallfish, a feature film and documentary editor. Today, we're talking to two-time Oscar nominee Joe Walker, ACE, about his work on the highly acclaimed film, Dune. As a frequent collaborator with director Denis Nerf, on Arrival, Sicario, and Blade Runner 2049, Joe has a wealth of insights for those who want to learn how to become a better editor, or even just a better storyteller. I'm going to start. You guys ready? Joe, you were my very first Art of the Cut interview, um, and it's kind of cool now that you're going to be the very first video interview. Wow. It's been six years. The first time I talked to you was 12 Years a Slave. After, yeah, after the Oscars, right? Mm-hmm. So you saw Lupita's speech and you contacted me. I remember that. Yeah. Both of us know that this is not a, a medium that one person does. It's not solely your work. It's a, it's a team. It's collaborative. Tell me a little bit about the people that you worked with on this. Well, working on Dunes, you know, really like working with a well-oiled team. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a well-rehearsed band. I've got a team where I can just get on the intercom and say, can you pop in, please? Or can we talk during the pandemic? We were texting all the time. And you could just say, hey, I need the sound of um, a Sardaukar guard. I need it sort of like, let's get going. And then they would, people would record their own things. I mean, I would record my own things. There was times when there's a, a spider, a human spider in the film. Oh, yeah. And at one point I thought, actually, the thing that really makes it, the detail that makes that thing really creepy is the way it's pushing a bowl around on a oh, concrete yeah. floor. So, um, you know, I went down to the garage and spent half an hour recording me pushing a bowl around. <laughs> you know, Did you have to do it with your nose? I had to do it with my nose. I had to act <laughs> rubber spider. Uh, we were talking about Denny and your relationship and, and COVID. And you edited this during COVID. Yeah. Um, there's a very interesting interview that I found on the web where he says he can't edit without you, kind of. He can't edit without you being in the same room and that it's kind of like you need to be like a band. Can you talk to me about that relationship you have with him and why why can't he just be on a Zoom call or some remote thing? I mean, you know, we started off in, in Budapest together and I was there on set. Afterwards, we moved back to LA and worked in the office and then the pandemic hit and we had to kind of close down and everybody ended up working in garden sheds and spare bedrooms and mother-in-law flats. And Denny was in Montreal and we worked through um, Evercast was the system we used. And I had to get used to seeing the front of his face, which isn't something I was very used to. I mean, I've sat to the left of him for so long. It's, you know, the right-hand side of his face is like the dark side of the moon. But um, anyway, when I got used to that, and the fact it was kind of interesting to me, I had the opportunity to actually read a scene on his face while he's watching it. Rather than look at the scene, which I know I've just cut it, Mm -hmm. I could look at him reacting to it, which is kind of very, very quick and honest way of working out what's, you know, I can almost tell what he's gonna say. It's very kind of Danny to say that in the video, and I feel like there's a truth in it that actually being in the room, the edit of this film somehow happens in the air between us, and and it's partly periods of identifying what a problem might be, and then finding the solution, which often takes a shorter amount of time <laughs> than finding what the problem is. Really discovering why isn't something ticking as it should be. And on this kind of scale of film, thank God you have the chance, and the pandemic, I have to say, was very kind to us to give us some time to kind of really think without the great heat of a schedule bearing upon us for a few months, just to, to dream a little bit and, and follow our instincts and develop things, which we did a great deal. Mm. A lot goes on in the cutting room, not necessarily exactly to do with cutting a film, but creating kind of a safe space for a director to work in. And also to immerse yourself in a sort of sense of what film did Denny want to make, you really need to touch base with the kind of core decision to make the film at some point. You need to kind of go back to the beginnings. And in Denny's case, you know, the fact that he discovered the book when he was 13 or 14. And at one wonderful point, a friend of his, Nicola, he's a great friend of his from from back at that time. And the two of them discovered the book together in some tiny village in Quebec. (laughs) 
They were dreaming already about Dune when they were 13, 14. And, and to my great pleasure, Nicola came one day. And that was a really special couple of days where I felt I was sort of in touch with the Ur moment, the original moment where, you know, boys in a bedroom dreamt up this kind of fantastic thing. And it was a time when we were experimenting with the opening and different versions of the opening. And I remember it was just a particularly great creative mood in the cutting room. There's long periods where sort of stuff doesn't seem to be happening and then masses happens in, in one afternoon. And especially when I can kind of call upon Theo in the next room to give me a kind of Bene Gesserit singing voice and Mary to give me this and Harry to give me that and this kind of team that we've built together. We all can turn on a sixpence and to serve this little uh, burst of creativity, you have to kind of allow a generous atmosphere to ideas. And, you know, it's a real process because if you look at my first assembly, it's, you know, probably arse-achingly long. And... What do you think the length was? I can't, I can't even remember. You know, length, this is something that I've discovered over the years, that length and the success of a story are not necessarily related. There's a big debate about long movies because mm -hmm. there's a movie just came out the other day, which is surprisingly, it's like over three hours long and you're just going, wow, that's a big ask, you know, and especially at my age with bladder control, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big ask. <laughs> but the paradox of it all is you can have a short film and it's less engaging. And in Dune, you know, the most important thing was to find the story compelling and to be on board with this family's journey into danger. And so, you know, maybe a lot of the adjustment to, at the beginning of the film is to do with that, is giving space and time to kind of set up those many characters and the constellation of those characters successfully before you test them. Put your right hand in the box. Your mother bade you obey me. I'd say the Gom Jabbar scene was the one we probably spent the longest time on. We were tinkering with that on and off for a year. I hold at your neck the Gom Jabbar. Poison needle. Instant death. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box and you die. It's in the box. Pain. It starts much more basic, right? When you first cut a scene like that, is it just the mother and Paul and were those flashbacks part of it in the original? They weren't there in the first cut. And what about the sound? Not, well, certainly not the full sound. No, design. there was nothing. That was really the big change we made to the scene, adding Paul's visions, something that takes on a life of its own in the whole structure of the film. It's a path that takes sometimes not long, and sometimes a long time. Some scenes honestly didn't change at all. There's, uh, an, there's a knife fight in the film that, that is the same as is frame accurate, the same as two days after they shot it. And that was a big shoot and I have bins and bins of material and I put it together and it honestly never changed. Denny isn't one to kind of like just change it for the sake of it. If it works exactly how he wanted it, then that's it. And he's put a lot of work in to make sure it works before I even, before they even shoot it. Hmm. Oddly enough, actually the scenes that we probably spent the longest time on with dialogue scenes. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the most important things, you can have, it doesn't matter how great the world building is, if you don't care for the central characters, then we might as well go home. Was that part of the structural changes that occurred in the film was a feeling that you needed to set something up early uh, so the audience cared later? Always, yeah. And... Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of discussion about that. How do you start the film? It's it's a, it's difficult. And again, here we go. We started with a little Sardaukar voice. We were just inspired by a sound that someone in the team chipped in. Actually, it was from Hans. 
you know, these things seem like good ideas that you might have just come up with because that's the idea, but actually they're often in relationship to a, to a task that you've discovered. And one of the tasks that we discovered was setting up the Saldekar. And I think in some way we wanted to, there's so many factions in Dune, you know, you have to set up the Harkonnens, the Mentats, the Atreides, the Saldekar, the Emperor, three planets. And I don't know how many characters, it's like a proper novel. Hmm. It's not a novella. And I try to get the balance of that right at the beginning of the film. That's difficult. There are so many ways of starting this film. Hmm. And we did consider most of them. Uh, you've done some um, film doctoring, let's call it. Uh, what I've heard from several people that have done that is oftentimes they go to, onto a film and one of the biggest problems is the setup is not there so nobody cares. So even though the, the film's compact and tight maybe and well edited even, you don't care. Trying to kind of preserve that in your own editing is like a really difficult challenge. And you, because, you know, if you're working on a project for 20 months, you know, you can get lost as an editor in that. And I feel like I'm using every trick in the book to try and um, keep fresh. How do you maintain objectivity? The best thing is weekends. <laughs> that is the best thing. Alcohol? Alcohol is definitely beneficial. <laughs> Look, I was cutting at home and I'm not going to say hand on heart that I didn't occasionally have a whiskey late at night while cutting Dune. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, for me, working at home is fantastic. There are sometimes there are things that are worrying you, you haven't fixed them, you've got a deadline. And like, rather than worry about it and stay awake at two in the morning, I'd go downstairs and go and cut something for half an hour, solve the problem, go back to bed and sleep like a baby. <laughs> but getting back to uh, keeping some kind of perspective, one of the tricks I've been using is um, to flop the image. This is just for myself because other people find it very distracting. And at one point I'd black and white and flop the image. So you watch the film, this is late stage. If you do this too early, you've, you've blown it too early, but basically, by flopping the image and make it black and white, your brain takes it a different way and it feels like a fresh viewing. It's a cheat. Um, there's an element that you're fighting against which the brain is giving you, I think, in endorphins when you see things that you like and recognize and that you see over and over again. A film has its moments that you become very attached to because they're very pleasurable. Your anticipation of them is pleasurable. And it's a bit like a sense of knowing how a song goes after you've listened to it 10 times. Um, and sometimes you have to remove that um, to get a sense of the audience. And I think the most important thing an editor does is to have an imaginary audience over his or her back driving your decision. What are they asking now? What question have they got? Have we successfully answered that question? Have we successfully posed the question? All of those things are like the most important thing an editor can do. And I feel like, you know, we're in a very privileged position being one of the first members of the audience of the dailies. So you are um, cutting a scene with that in mind all the time. Well, let's talk about the book itself. Did you read the book before you did the editing? It's so funny. I've met so many people on this, um, on this project who said, oh my God, I read Dune when I was 12 or 13, and it's a really seminal book. And I think there's a strong element of that response to the book in the film. A, a very small example is that in the dream sequences, we use a connecting device, which was a flare. Denny had seen the camera chip responded to the light in a certain way. And it feels a little bit like, um, you know, when you're a kid and dreaming in the summer and your eyes are half shut, exactly. It's a sense of almost your eyelashes at one point with these beautiful striations of light. So I kind of feel like the film is very much in touch with that perspective on the book. We were in the middle of Blade Runner 2049, and he said, you should read the book and, and tell me what you think. And uh, I read it, I was very engaged. So I'm a late, you know, I was, I'm a late adopter. I read the book before I read his script, and I did think he'd, you know, he'd bitten off a lot. <laughs> I mean, we're in the middle of Blade Runner where, you know, we're, we're walking on sacred carpets cinematically. 
trying not to mess them up. And uh, I think, you know, the idea that you go from that to June where, I mean, the, the fans are going to come with their baseball bats, is what Denny said to me. I think it's a magical book, and I think it's very timely, amazingly, for a book written in the late 60s. And I think it has lots of things. I could totally see why it captivated Denny. It's sort of got many themes that he's interested in, and the environment, and um, the sort of relationship between women and power, I think, is a big ingredient. Uh, what about the movie? Uh, Lynch. The um, Lynch film, yes. I saw it a long time ago. I sort of deliberately avoided watching it again. Mm. I mean, let me just say this, David Lynch is, you know, he changed my mind when I was 18 to such a degree. I saw a razor head in a oh, yeah. in screen <laughs> on the hill in London. So many Friday cinema night. students of our age, right? A razor head. Yeah, there's no going back after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you spend such a profound amount of time rethinking everything you knew about the moving image. Mm -hmm. So I have the utmost respect for him. But, you know, honestly, the main source for us was the book and only mm -hmm. the book. And uh, I think most people know this. You guys are not trying to cover the full scope of the book in this film. Yeah. That's about to come out. I think um, it was Eric Roth and Denny who, who picked the lock, if you like, of the book and worked out a way to divide it. And um, no, I thought it was very, I mean, I think it's incredibly wise. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much depth. I mean, the thing about the book is the detail. And, you know, Herbert isn't, I mean, there's a difference between a book and a film, as everybody knows. But, you know, a good example of this is that Paul Atreides is known by five or six names in the book. He's, he's Paul Atreides, Muad'Dib, Mahdi, The One, Kwisatz Haderach, Listen out, Gaib. I mean, there's probably more. It's like the Bible. There's many words for God in the Bible. And I think it's a kind of almost deliberate Frank Herbert, almost like a fractal approach to storytelling. And there's density of detail. That's not a necessarily cinematic thing. I think a very typical cinematic thing is simplicity and economy. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, we were looking for that in the cut, but also paying, you know, our dues to the book and also to the depth of that imagination that Frank Herbert originally had. As an editor, you could easily find low-hanging fruit to cut if you wanted to shorten the film, but you would have lost a lot. I mean, there's a little scene that I love, which is um, where Paul Atreides meets a gardener on Arrakis. He sees the palm trees and the gardener explains the sacrifice that's made to keep these palm trees alive and to keep an old dream alive, to once again have water, a desert planet. You should be out here this hour of the day. It felt like a great way to encounter the Fremen kind of concepts mm -hmm. and Arrakis itself and to show that Paul is, um, you know, his inquisitiveness actually saves him. It's adapt or die in the desert. So, you know, you could cut that, but you'd lose the depth and the storytelling and the, and the world building. And in this film, I don't think I've seen any other film that has got this level of world building. As an editor, it would just be foolish to disregard that. Yeah, there's beautiful moments that are just where the film opens up a little bit. And those are just so important, I think, for the audience, right? You, you don't want to rush from beginning to end. Dune, if nothing else, is for me one massive uh, work of rhythm. And, you know, my background's in music and You're sound. a composer. Yeah. I studied classical music at uh, York University and uh, it wasn't kind of um, Baroque music or anything. It was nasty 20th century, you know, Stockhouse and Stravinsky, uh, Berio, Lutoslavsky, Ligeti, all those kind of, you know, brutal uh, it's not, I mean, it's not surprising I get on with Denny and his tastes <laughs> and things. But, I mean, it was always, I've always been, when I was writing music, it's, it's not so dissimilar. There's many things, you know, I was pushing things around with a mouse and um, on originally on an Atari ST using MIDI files and things. And then you start developing a kind of a sense of what's foreground, what's background. And there's a lot of similarities, but the main thing is pace and rhythm. 
I'd say editing, I've got the additional benefit of performance and working with this amazing cast. So that rhythm could be, you know, the sound of a thumper, or it could be the raising of an eyebrow by Stephen McKinley Henderson, or, um, you know, the rhythm of the cuts itself, or the kind of global, bigger, tectonic plates moving underneath the story, that kind of rhythm. Mm. It's got an interesting rhythm, this film, because it starts actually quite gently and builds up your interest in the characters. And then I think it's accelerative and becomes very uh, dynamic. I was thinking about that with the, your story about the, um, the asking about the palm trees, because later on in the movie, you see those same, I'm not going to give anything away, but you see those same palm trees and the shot means something to you because you've had this earlier shot that's happened. They're burning, yeah. I can say. Yeah. They're burning. And so all of that hope and all that, all of those dreams are, are kind of kicked by the power. There's a tragedy to that. Yeah. But like you said, you could have easily cut that scene out. It didn't mean anything to the real story, but then you've lost some kind of emotional energy. Some of these rhythms I'm talking about might have a really long span. For example, images which echo little signposts by which we measure our character's progress. For example, things like Leto's ring. Or planting in a premonition that image of a beetle. I saw you lying dead, fallen in battle which maybe we recall when Duncan sees it just prior to the Sardaukar battle, adding a sense of doom. Here's the thing. I think with Denny's films, it gives me a chance to play with something super, and it's very hard to find the word for this, but I would call it brain stemmy images. It's appealing to some part of the brain that's old and not necessarily verbal. It's not necessarily front lobal. I don't know what the hell it is, but I can describe those images. I can give you a list of them in, in the film. And they're all very sensory, incredibly sensory. A really good example for me, one of my favorite shots in the movie, it's, it's weird that your favorite shots aren't always the biggest shots. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my favorites is the shot of Lady Jessica waiting as the, the bull is being packed into a packing case and she's about to leave her home for all of her life and step onto a planet where death and disaster awaits. And there's a moment just focused on the back of her neck and you feel her anxiety and then uh, Duke Leto's hand comes in and reassures her and, and it's the hand on the back of the neck which we all know what that feels like and it's for me anyway it's been a you know a favorite part of my life <laughs> that sens sensation but also what it says about the trust between those people it's so much bigger and more beyond a whole scene it's just one shot yeah. it's finding a way in the edit to kind of give those images the best pillow, you know, the best placing, the best timing, so that, and actually it's rich, the film is rich in these sensory moments, whether it's a foot on the sand for the first time, or whether it's a hand in water, there's lots of images that actually connect together in some way that I can't even begin to fathom, but I just know they work. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned some of those uh, moments that we were talking about that are not simply beauty shots, but are helping world build and do these other things in the film. Um, it also, some of those moments had beautiful sound design under them. Was there also a thought of giving the sound team or hands a place to, you know, explore a little playground, a little sandbox for them? Oh, totally. I mean, the, that's the thing. If I talk about the teamwork, then there's a moment where they arrive in the desert and they're on their own. Lady Jessica and Paul have got to traverse the desert to find the Fremen. And we felt like a strong need set up that the next obstacle is worms. We're in the deep desert and these things are the size of a tower block or a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. And they follow rhythmic noise. 
We just felt like it was important to make a kind of big statement. Denny um, had shot this extraordinary landscape shot, looking into this flat expanse of sand. And I mean, it's 17 seconds long, which it doesn't sound like a lot, but actually at that point in a film, you know, you're very conscious of the fact that your audience is, you know, is waiting for you to get a wiggle on and <laughs> resolve this story. They know it's going to resolve, they just don't know how. And we've got this last big obstacle before hopefully there's a resolution. Um, so it's kind of a little bit, you know, uh, daring do to put in a shot the 17 seconds. And especially when it's in the initial stages, it's, it's just a plate shot of the expanse of desert. Yeah. And we were saying, no, we need to feel the music come to an end. Then we need to feel the roar underneath. Wait for it and then erupt and see the collapse and then cut. You know, it has to have these sort of four or five beats. beats within the one shot, which in the initial stages, it's just a beautiful GV of the desert. It doesn't have that narrative element. So which, how do you build that up? You know, you, maybe at that stage, we're using temp tracks, maybe um, also with the sound team, I'm saying, okay, this is what it's going to be like. And that's, you know, I'll put a little red dot and say, that's when we first see the worm erupt. Um, that's where we're going to see the, the, the sand collapse behind. You build it up with the use of the team. Together, we're trying to find the whole rhythm of the film and to allow all departments their moment in the sun. Mm. I mean, a good example, there's a shot in a kind of engineering yard. We're about to go out into the desert. It occurred to us relatively late that we should show how a carryall works. It shows you the thing successfully picking up a spice harvester. The idea is you'll understand better later when it fails to do that. The very first concept of that was actually somewhere on my iPhone, I've got a picture of Denny's <laughs> hand picking up a, a, a box of matches or something and just showing how long it should take. As you said, you need something there to give you a sense of the pace and the timing. Well, you just add details until it's convincing at the end of the day. I put <laughs> such <laughs> nonsense into this cut. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit of the, the hunter seeker. Oh. Tell me about that, cutting the, the first time. Rhythmic noises which attract the sandworms, the Fremen cross desert spaces using the sandwalk. Dance -like motion with the Hunter Seeker sequence is a sequence where Paul Atreides is looking at a film book uh, with the most amazing English voiceover. So who did that? I don't know, but the, everybody should hire him. <laughs> I am Denny's kind of go-to for the sweet-talking sound of British imperialism. Uh, now back to the Hunter Seeker. So Paul's reading this book. Yeah, it's a nasty little bug that comes out of a hole in the headboard of his bed. It creeps around the room and it makes a rather nasty, silvery noise. One component of which was my assistant Mary's voice pretending to be a fly. And, um, but anyway, I mean, for the longest time, how do you, I've just got plates. I've got empty plates of the empty room, maybe with a kind of camera pan or a tilt up. So you're trying to kind of find a way how long to hold for this thing and especially because it's really creepy when it's slow. I ended up putting on text using a title tool. Every shot had the word hunter seeker going past very slowly in the foreground. <laughs> yeah, I did really well. I used perspective, which I'd never done with the title before. Anyway. How do you take a scene seriously with that? Oh, hunter seeker word. I'm very through. lucky that this is film number four with Denny, so I didn't get fired. I think, <laughs> Anybody else looking at it would laugh. But, but seriously, for you, though, as you said, you need something there to give you a sense of the pace. Well, I'm, I'm using every trick in the book to do that. And it also is helpful for the VFX team. There was an amazing guy, Patrick, and my VFX editor, Javier, who worked together in the background to then take those and turn it into the first pass of this little bug moving through. But I'm, I'm also using the sound that Theo's mm -hmm. made. And we had really great temp tracks put in by um, Clint Bennett and Peter Miles, two amazing music editors. So I'm, I've got a great team of people who are chipping into this sequence to help me find the timing. 
you know, we build these sequences up with scratch music, scratch image, scratch sound effects, even scratch dialogue. You know, just to propel the cut, I'm kind of a firm believer in constantly building the thing up detail by detail. Thank you. If you want it, make me give it to you. Use the voice. Mom, I just woke up. One of the beautifully edited scenes that I wanted to talk to you about was fairly early in the movie, I will call it the give me the water scene. It's the first time you already mentioned uh, using that, the voice. And there's beautiful sound design and there's imagery that's not on the table. There's the, you explore the rest of the room, mm. you're showing color and world building, as you said. Yep. Can you talk about that sequence? So we've got the scene where he's commanding his mother to, to hand him a glass of water and we cut round. We wanted to set up the bullfighting grandfather and the little um, sculpture of the, of the bull. And there was a beautiful chandelier or some tinkling metal. And I found a sound that helped me create a certain dreaminess and a certain spaciness. Water. Almost. There's this concept, the voice, which is a, a hypnotic command. The ideas for that came out of lots of discussion and trying things out. Denise suggested this idea that the Bene Gesserit voices could be summoned and you should be able to hear kind of the ancestry. Originally, the, the plan was to have a bass thump at the same time as he says, give me the water. But we needed to tell a story longer term, which is that he's learning. So he, you hear the and then you hear witchy voices saying, give me the water. And she, it almost works, but not quite. And that contrasts with when you meet the Reverend Mother. Get out. It understands. In the book, Paul's skill is that he's the first male Bene Gesserit in a way. He's able to kind of reach to the past. And you could do that in, in sound terms by recording um, the words that he uses to command somebody with layers and layers of different witches' voices. Mm. And for that, we recorded two, two or three people. Gene Gilpin, who's amazing, and just did endless <laughs> sessions. And you uh, mentioned uh, that Marianne Faithful, right, is a voice in the film? Yeah. At one point, we had Marianne Faithful, and she wasn't well at the time. And uh, she recorded some stuff for us. You can just hear her actually in the wake of Charlotte Rampling's voice, which gives me great pleasure because I think they were old drinking buddies in the 60s, <laughs> back on the King's Road. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here, Neil. I want to ask you about a couple of scenes. As we watch this, tell me a little bit about the editing decisions you're making. Uh, I guess I'm not in the mood today. Mood? Yeah. What's mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Now fight! How much I love Josh Brolin. He's fantastic in this film. For me, a knife fight is like it's kind of sophisticated rhythmic ballet. Come on! There's a little bit of cutting there to, you know... He didn't take two steps forwards and swipe, he swipes. So you're kind of wrong-footing, you're, you're saying that came from nowhere. Mm. Because that feels more dangerous, not like a training exercise, but like your life depends on it. Mm -hmm. That was the watchword. Mm -hmm. In reality, he picked his blade up and that's not there, he's just swinging. You're seeing, pushing, you're seeing the... St yeah. I'm pushing ahead, mm -hmm. so there's tension, tension, boom, delivery, too fast. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before, the landscaping of time. Yeah. Jumping forward so that you can hold back later. Man. It's a sense of things happening too fast. You're trying always as an editor to be 
in parallel or ahead of the audience, slightly ahead, not too far ahead and never behind. Right. If you're behind, you're dead. If they already know how this scene is going to end, if they already know how this story is going to end, if they already know how it's going to resolve, then you're dead. Mm -hmm. If you allow them the time to kind of like... Figure it out. And figure it out better than you probably have. I have you. Hi. I'm going to look down, my lord. You to join me in death. I see you found the mood. Do you know this is one of the first scenes to be shot? Mm. I think it was the first scene to be shot. Wow. Yeah, this is taking me back. This is like March 2019. And did you, did, when you were cutting this, obviously you didn't have all of the uh, VFX stuff that's in there around their bodies. It's basically, it's protecting them from killing each other. Um, you didn't have that, but did you feel like you needed the sound to help you? Or oh, no? we were working on that sound ahead of the VFX. Actually, the sound drove the VFX in this case. Um, Theo found a kind of cat purr sort of sound. The idea was that it would become more, you know, like a tear sound when, you, when it gets close. The concept is the slow blade penetrates the shield. And setting this up here helps with the battle scene later where you see bombs that spin and slowly go into a shield and then blow the object up from inside. Come on. Oh, man. Do you ever play dialogue scenes without the audio? Yeah, I mean, with Denny, a lot of the time we will review a scene without any audio at all. A it's dialogue. Just, yeah, well, any audio. Just turn the speakers off. Mm -hmm. And just, we're trying to kind of make it work like a silent movie. If you can, and it makes you hyper aware when you turn the sound off, you become hyper aware of people's eyes. And I feel like eyes, that's a serious part of what we do, is driving the cut by the expression in the eyes. So it's done. It's done. It's all looking for an efficiency. Um, I'm going to depart from this for a moment just to say that one of my great favorite moments on Cutting Dune was working with Hans, and I've collaborated with him so many times. And at one point, he was noodling around on the keyboard, and we were all on an Evercar session, and he was trying to kind of find something, and I couldn't tell. And I just said, Hans, what are you actually looking for right now? And uh, he said, I'm looking for something with the efficiency of the word fuck. <laughs> and I can't it's, an it's a very efficient word. It's a very efficient word. You know, uh, multi, it's international. There's some crazy report somewhere that I read that all nuns who have strokes say the word fuck. <laughs> it's universal, it's super efficient, but also it's malleable. If you're a composer and you're writing a little fragment that can become uh, a love theme, a chase theme, uh, um, a worm theme, whatever it is, it's universal. It's something you can say, I fucking love you, or you can say, I fucking hate you. And it's, it's just as punchy and efficient. But to me, I'm looking for an efficiency too of, of emotional expression and trying to kind of like get out of the way. And especially because it's been designed as a cinematic experience. Its native format is not an iPhone. It's a big screen. And if you're way too busy driving the cuts, it's exhausting. If you're at the front of an iMac screen looking at something that's like moving around too fast, it's nauseating. This is a film where you have dramatic, violent scenes and they're all, you know, super fast and exciting. But you want to kind of be able to look into the characters and feel something. A, a good example I give in Dune is when Stilgar arrives in court. It's all nicely set up. Everybody said, you know, the leader of the Fremen has come to visit us. He comes up to the desk. Stop there. Hey! Hey! And I've got this medium close-up of Javier Bardem looking at everybody with disdain. Stilgar. Welcome. Sir, I respect the personal dignity of any man that respects mine. Hold. <clears throat> Thank you, Stilgar, for the gift of your body's moisture. 
we accept it in the spirit in which it was given. That scene, by the way, you know, I've got Oscar Isaac, Stephen McKinley Henson, I've got Josh Brolin, I've got Timothée Chalamet, and Jason Momoa. They're all acting their hearts out, and there's moments that I could have used from everybody. There's so many reasons to interrupt that cut, but I, I'm glad that we ended up just holding that shot because there's tension to it. Mm. Massive tension. You don't know what he's going to do. He seems to hate them all. Then he spits, and it's kind of uh, a surprise. I just get out of the way sometimes. That's the efficiency of it. It's less efficient if I'm busy with everybody as tempting as they are. Tons of great reaction shots you could have used. Could have used. You've got this massive abundance of shots. And I say, you know, as an editor, we, we've known each other for seven years or so, but, you know, I've been in the cutting room since 85. And thankfully, things get better and better and better, and you end up being given this table full of riches. Um, the wisdom is in sort of knowing when to avoid that and to sort of let a moment play, I think. Mm. Having a little restraint. So no older cops or what? Well, Dipper? She Fleming. You know the ancient tongues. I know many things. I know that you have a weapon concealed in your bodies. If you mean to harm me. So she's got a hand signal with the personal guard using a hand language which has already been established earlier between Paul and Jessica. What's already nice as an editor is you've got two things going on, right? So it's kind of intercutting one thing and the other, and you can be quite, you know, epigrammatic, very curt and short in that, you know, you don't have to show the whole shot, you just see the sword coming out. Her bodyguard is ready. Yeah. Also, you know, um, Lady Jessica is... If you mean to harm me... Badass. I must warn you, whatever you're hiding, it won't be enough. The other thing that I love about that badass moment is after she finishes speaking, you don't cut away, you sit it won't be enough. on the face as she is holds, it, like she's very to, sure of herself. That's right, you're, trying to, you're, you're always trying to balance letting the audience see something for themselves through the eyes of the person opposite. So you're basically giving the audience what Shout Out Mapes is seeing, in a way. You know, it's kind of like that's the fascination of editing, isn't it? Is, is do we show somebody reacting to something or do we show the thing itself? And there's a strong efficiency. Back to Hanson, the word fuck. You know, there's a strong efficiency to seeing something in vision and seeing somebody say something conclusively. And then the little extra weight I always find in editing, some of the weight is before or after a line. So you kind of, you know, you don't want to just cut robotically. Here you've got a chance to show her confidence physically. Only then, and this is the key thing in the scene, to subvert it and see a slight vulnerability when she realizes the fervor of religious opinion she's surrounded by. Yeah. The weapon is meant as a gift. If you are truly the one. That's what I love That's, right there. If, if you're you are truly, truly the, the one, one and that's, you cut to her, and yep. you, you see that hesitation. There's something in her eyes. Yeah, she's seeing the net result of thousands of years of interference in another culture, basically. I'm sure you've got a ton of coverage that you could use here. What's the purpose of holding on this wide shot from the side? There's a tension to it. A negative space waiting to be breached. You feel as though she could leap forward and that, that, that could erupt. Do you know its meaning? It's a maker. I've got a huge advantage, which is that Denny shoots single camera. What is the impact of that? It means that first of all, all his shots are just Perfect. Um, second thing is I don't have three, four hours of material to look at. It's less time to process. Um, I'm not saying it's short of things to look at. There's lots of units <laughs> working. There's, you know, VFX uh, second unit doing things. There's plates being shot in the desert. There's masses of stuff. Um, flares. Flares, <laughs> hours of flares. But the advantage is, is that I know, I've learned the dailies. I think that's the job of the editor is that, and you never know when that's going to come in useful, that some tiny little thing that you're going to, that is going to get you out of jail. 
from it doesn't even belong to the scene is going to crop up in your mind later and go, oh man, I do remember this. I've got something. You know, uh, famously the opening of Gladiator, not my work, but um, famously that's a B-roll shot of the hands going across the corn. Mm. You know, it's just somebody's like remembered how the, the material that was presented to them. And, you know, uh, it's impossible to keep track of three cameras day in, day out. It's very, very hard. And also it's often, you know, at least one of the cameras is going to feature another camera in it, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't, that might be the end or yeah. almost the end. Let's try another one. Yeah. Fear's the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings obliteration. Cutting it, we wanted this idea of the Kwisatz Haderach to be born. It's what Reverend Mother is looking for. Lady Jessica wasn't meant to have a, a son, she was meant to have a daughter. And the Bene Gesserit arrive on the planet to say, if you're not up to the task, then we're going to kill you. And mum's outside and she fears he's not ready. So there's a lot going on in the scene. And in the kind of moment of duress, we flash inside and something resilient, something really powerful is, is revealed to us, the audience, and to Reverend Mother. Building that scene, we had shots we wanted to use, including burning palm trees and some sense of the future. But also, there was this tiny little fragment of sound that had come. At very early stages, Hans gave us pieces of music, and they weren't necessarily destined for any particular scene. And in one of the tracks, there's a singer called Loire who recorded this chant in a, in, in a wardrobe in her apartment in New York. We just tried it out and it was, it, it just suddenly everybody was, you know, played it back to hands and he was like, wow. We also developed the voice, the witchy voices come into that and this sort of sense that there's a presence around him. It came from all the team, everybody working together to try and kind of make these little focal points, uh, develop them hand in hand. I mean, it wasn't like we finished an idea and then hand it over. It's like we do it all together, all the time. Enough. I don't believe you're the Lison al Gahib. But I want you to die with honor. This was shot like in different times and it all, you know, it was all constructed from different locations. I mean, it was shot in many different the, places. The scene looks seamless to me. Tell me a little bit about like what, what's shot in one location, what's shot in props another. To, props to Paul Lambert. I'm gonna probably get this wrong because it's like two years ago. That's Jordan. The knife. Yeah. The handle of the knife. That is Hungary. The knife on the floor. California. Oh my gosh. Jordan. It's made from a tooth of Shai Halud, the great sandworm. This will be a great honor for you to die holding it. That, I think, is California. That is Jordan. Where's the outworlder? That's Jordan. That's Jordan. I mean, it's all crazy. It's so, just... on a scene like this, I'm noticing, you know, wh what's the size that you're choosing? What's the angle? I talked to Tom Cross on No Time to Die, yeah. who I know is a good friend of yours. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that he mentioned was, I cut the scene one way where I thought that the scenes were the most powerful looking at the person from the front. Yeah. That was the most powerful performance when you're seeing someone like this. But then he was asked to recut the scene and he chose the side angles because it was more graphical. Did you, do you feel like when you're watching a scene like this that you're, you're choosing a certain shot size over another? Or like what are the purposes? That's a really, you know, it's a key way to figure out the structure of a scene is to look at all the material and then say, okay, it's nearly always the case that the main source is in the close-up. And you kind of, if the scene has one, that's something where you are trying to figure out how do we get there. 
And at what point do we get there? Because it's got an intensity that all the other shots don't have. All the other ones are giving you atmosphere and content and performance and everything, all the nice things, but it's the close-up where you really go, bang, that's the point. That's the moment where he realizes or whatever it is that the scene is doing. And for me, it's always a, a mental game of figuring out almost backwards, how, how do we get there? When I see the dailies, I can, I can often see that moment and clearly, and I, then I'll go straight, jump forward to that moment in the scene and put the shots either side that I need and, and see whether that, how, and then I can figure out how to get there. I sort of cut backwards sometimes. Mm -hmm. I got a chance to see the lovely uh, place that you get to edit in your, at your house. Uh, I was surprised by a couple of things. One, tell us a little bit about how you monitored sound. I would figure, man, this movie would need five one surround while you were editing. And you edit on a very small monitor, maybe 32 inches or if that. 24 or something. Um, yeah, I mean, my monitor is small, but I'm very close to it. <laughs> um, but we also check on big screens. We screen on big screens and so we're always taking, in fact, we started editing Dune on, you know, full 143, because a large component of it is shot IMAX. And in fact, the whole of Reel 8, as it was, is from beginning to end is IMAX originated material. And very important to look at that stuff for VFX, you know, there's more plate for them to figure out, you know, if there's a bit of vegetation on the floor that can't be there on Arrakis, then that might be on the foot and you don't see it if you're cropping. So I think it was advisable to look at it. The full aspect ratios we did our first cuts. I was very concerned about those moments of transition and obviously concerned if you were going between two aspect sizes and whether it was damaging. And in fact, on the IMAX screen, I was amazed at how free it is. And Denny had already reassured me, I think he'd spoken to Chris Nolan and, you know, that you're quite free to kind of go between 239 and 143. On the IMAX screen, it's so massive, you don't necessarily see it or feel it that, that much. So I think I was kind of probably overly worried about that. And once we'd felt confident, we flipped over to cutting 239 and it felt like a less distracting viewing experience for most people. When we're getting, you know, about to show it to the producers and things like that, we flipped over to 239. Um, and audio monitoring, I mean, I should, in the past I have done left, center, right. And at one point I did left, center, right and subs. The problem with the subs was that it really pissed off the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I kind of abandoned that. But, and also I use rumbles, like, I mean, the rumble sound effect is probably due for retirement. But um, no, nowadays I actually cut with left and right, only left and right. And the reason for that is I just don't have any throw. There's, if I was in a deeper room, the sound, you know, left, center, right, maybe surrounds and sub, I can do a full, you know, I could cut like that. But the problem I have is I haven't got the space where it's melting. So I feel very distracted by the fact that I'll have something, you know, dialogue coming out of the center and a gunshot coming out of the right. And it, it suddenly feels like, oh, you know, there's a mismatch. When you're this close. When you're that close. It's only, it's the limitations of the size of my room, but then I like, I'm just really comfortable in my room. When we review sound effects, we're reviewing in a 7-1 environment. When we're, you know, there are all these other spaces that you go and test it. Joe, um, I am so excited that we got a chance to do this uh, video interview about Dune. It's a fantastic movie. I got a chance to see it before we did this interview, obviously, and wow, congratulations. Thank you very, very much. Nice one. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, let's have some lunch. Thank you.